uh, we'll now take up with, uh, we're going to try to do this a little different this afternoon. Uh, well, not actually different, we're going to do 30 minutes of, of uh, each side. I'll start with uh, the proponents as this morning. And the first person I have on the list is Jared Rodriguez. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jared Rodriguez and I'm with the Michigan Alliance for Business Growth. I've come here today to talk a little bit about the Michigan experience and our uh, movement towards freedom to work. First and foremost, uh, we believe that workers deserve the right to choose. It's just not fair in today's world that anyone should have a government-created monopoly that permanently supplies them with members and revenue. Unions should fight for their members and the key point is earn their support. If unions are working on behalf of their employees, employees will be happy to contribute. If not, workers should have that right to pull their financial contributions and keep money of their own in their own pockets or take home pay. We believe that freedom to work ensures workplace fairness and equality, giving workers more control over their own personal decisions and life choices. The hardworking taxpayers and the workers of Missouri deserve that right to choose whether they would like to join a private labor organization or not. A total of 24 states, other states, uh, other than 23 other than Michigan, have, are currently providing hardworking families with that workplace fairness and equality. For this reform that we're talking about today, in Missouri, a person, employee, and any other organization may not force an individual to become or remain a member of a private labor organization, pay dues, assessments, or other changes of any kind or amount to a private labor organization. And lastly, they would not be forced to pay any fees or donations to a third party as a condition of their employment. Freedom to work simply protects workers from being required to join or pay dues to a labor organization as a condition of getting or keeping a job. It prohibits the inclusion of security provisions in labor contracts that force workers to join a union against their choice. Missouri families deserve more choices control over their own lives, an experience in which we fought for in Michigan. Freedom to work will restore workplace fairness and equality for all. Every Missourian worker should be able to choose for her or himself if they want to join a union or pay, pay a part of their wages towards that organization. Every Missourian should also have the right to get and keep a job based on their performance, not politics. Freedom to work reforms do not prohibit labor unions or collective bargaining. They simply protect workers from being forced to join a union or pay dues to a labor union against their will. A dozen of, dozens of other states have already empowered their workers with workplace fairness and equality and still have unions. In Michigan, the workforce is 17.8% unionized. After Michigan becomes a freedom to work state officially, on March 27th, they should continue to have 17.8% union membership if the unions continue to provide an added value benefit to workers. <coughs> Protecting workers will make the state more attractive to new, to new industries and new jobs, the number one reason why Michigan acted. Certainly with those jobs will lead to, to higher economic growth and a healthier economy for states that enact freedom to work legislation. Simply put, freedom to work will help Missouri attract new jobs that are needed to compete in the 21st century. This will help economically challenged communities around the state to recover faster, and it will put Missouri on the right track to move forward by creating opportunities not only to today's workers, but 
two tomorrows as well. Why do unions oppose freedom to work? As I mentioned before, if unions are doing their job, they should have nothing to fear by giving employees a choice. The problem is that unions have evolved into massive political campaign contribution machines over the years, financed by the involuntary enforced dues and fees of employees across many states in our country. Michigan workers, in our experience, were forced to give money to causes that they don't believe in, to candidates that they don't support. I presume that the same thing is happening here in Missouri. We firmly believe that it's not fair to force someone against their will to join an organization, to financially support an organization, or to be a part of it if they choose not to. Taking money out of their paycheck to donate to political partisan candidates is not the American way. We believe in freedom, the freedom to choose what you do, what you join, and what you don't. It's been a couple of conversations this morning. We believe, and I believe, that unions argue that freedom to work is unfair because according to federal law, they're obligated to represent non-members, and that's come up earlier this morning in earlier testimony. They argue that freedom to work gives employees that opt out free ride and existing members must make up the difference. This is simply not true, as we heard from this morning. Mark Mix also addressed this. Through the Supreme Court decision in 1938, expressly upheld the union's ability to negotiate <coughs> only on behalf of its members. The law protects unions' right to bargain on behalf of its members only. Unions voluntarily represent all workers, members and non-members, because it increases their leverage for contracts. With that, I would be happy to take any questions, but before I do, I want to share a little, a couple of statistics. What we've seen and the reason why Michigan moved forward and the reason why I believe it's important. Some examples of personal income growth. We've talked a little bit about statistics this morning. Everyone can Google and find statistics, but what we've seen in personal income growth, per capita income grew 20% in Michigan from 2000 to 2010. During the same time frame, freedom to work states grew 39%, and non-freedom to work states only grew 34%. When it comes to real growth in gross state product, from 98 to 2001, Michigan grew at 26.5%, while gross state product growth was at 64% among non-right-to-work states. Freedom to work states grew at 85%. Job growth, something that Michigan has struggled with over the years. Its reliance on the auto industry has been a negative impact. From 2001 to 2010, Michigan's non-farm employment dropped nearly 17%. Non-freedom to work states grew at 0.5%. And freedom to work states grew nearly 4%. This is the Michigan experience, the reason why Michigan became the 24th freedom to work state. We would expect that others would also see these advantages, not only for the hardworking taxpayers of your state, but also for economic growth. With that, I'll take questions. Mr. Chairman, uh, <clears throat> may I suggest, since I'm the next witness uh, support here, that uh, maybe I make a few comments and then open it up, both of us, to questions, if that would please the Chairman. Do you have any objections? Okay, my name is Lou Gillard. I'm president of the National Tax Limitation Committee. We uh, have a number of members here in your fair state. <clears throat> and we actually go back to Mel Hancock, who carried the Hancock Amendment, which was a uh, fallout of the design that we worked and developed for Ronald Reagan when he was governor and worked for him at that time. And it's interesting that in his background, that of Ronald Reagan, why he was a member of the union, the Screen Actors Guild, and but that was an all-voluntary union operation. <clears throat> the key, as Jared has suggested in our judgment, is freedom of choice. One of our mentors in the National Tax Limitation Committee 
Milton Friedman emphasized volunteerism in his book, Free to Choose, Truly the American Way. Uh, the, a very important, uh, I thought, fact about your fair state is that your public employees are not required to be union members. And yet, as we look at the statistics uh, in that category, why some 100,000 of your public employees have voluntarily agreed to and have joined the uh, public employee unions in your state. Uh, we've had lots of experience in California with paycheck protection, uh, trying to get that protection for workers passed as part of California law, but on reflection, and we had that effort on the last November ballot as Prop 32, I think on reflection we find that right to work directly as distinguished from a, uh, a paycheck protection uh, may well be the preferable uh, public policy course and one of the reasons that we're here to uh, support this piece of legislation. And we will be, uh, through our National Tax Limitation Committee and affiliated organizations, will be working with taxpayers and citizen groups here in uh, Missouri to explain this legislation to our members and encourage support as, uh, as these uh, progress in your legislative process. That's why we're here and pleased to join with you and we certainly appreciate the uh, courtesy with which we've been treated and uh, I was very impressed with the uh, union leader who stepped forward uh, a short time ago and urged uh, uh, all of the union members to act with great courtesy and deference to all witnesses. And we certainly appreciate that. I just want, you're with what group now? I'm with the Michigan Alliance for Business Growth. Okay, so you're with businesses in Michigan? Taxpayers, yes. We're, we're supported by taxpayers all around the United States. Okay. So in Missouri, you said that uh, you keep using the word forced. Where are these forced workers that you're talking about who are forced to join a union in Missouri? Where are they? Why aren't they here to testify? I'm sorry, why aren't they here to testify? Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I can't answer that question. My thought is that they should be here to testify. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in my experience, they, they won't come forward out of fear of retribution for losing their their job. Their well, how would they lose their job? They're not employed by the union, they're employed by the company. The union just affords them benefits. I asked the same question, Representative. Okay. I have another question for you. You said that, um, you know, you were talking about uh, unfairness, you know, uh, to workers. But what about the workers who are denied because of unfairness from businesses and corporations? See, you, the unions only come about because workers, the majority of the workers, want to negotiate with the employer. So I'm trying to figure out, because I've been on the organizing side too. Sure. So if you have 60% of the workers that says, we're being treated unfairly, we want to collectively organize, what about those workers' rights to negotiate a contract? I couldn't agree with you more. In fact, you know, 60% is not 100%. Well, However, I believe that all workers should have the right and the freedom to organize, join, financially contribute to a union if they so choose. Just as I believe they should have the right and the freedom to not be forced to join, contribute, or associate with a private well, organization. Well, let's get it back goes to, either way. Let's go back to this force. Because <clears throat> I've been in labor a long time. And I don't remember being forced. I remember it being a choice. So if, if you have this majority of workers that has negotiated certain benefits and packages and you come to this place and you want to benefit from this 
increase in salary and the benefits that have been uh, negotiated for you. You don't want to pay your fair share because it's my understanding, you know, that um, people pay a portion. If you don't want to be affiliated with the views, you, you pay a portion of the representation that you get. So I'm not getting where you're forced. That's, that's another part. And the other part is, you're talking about, um, you said that it was evidence. I think that's the word you use. That, um, that uh, workers uh, in Missouri don't have this choice. But let me ask you this. We have five of the largest business corporations in this state are against what you're proposing here. So they are the largest employers in our state, and we have employers in our state that are non-union, and they don't have a problem with being one of the largest corporations here, and they employ a lot of people. So, I mean, we have both of best of both worlds. So I'm not understanding when you said that. You know, you keep saying there's evidence. I don't see that evidence in Missouri. It might be in Michigan, but I'm not seeing it in Missouri. I don't believe I used the word evidence, but. You know, if, if you were to bring in those corporations, as you know, I don't speak for them. Um, and, and House Bill 77 is a bill that we believe will bring more freedom and opportunity and choice to workers across this state. Again, what's fair, what's unfair rather, is forcing an employee to financially contribute a portion of their hard-earned dollars out of their paycheck if they choose not to, if they do not want to, they should not be forced to as a condition. What's unfair of is for them to benefit from something and haven't paid for that benefit. See, you know, you can't have 100% anything. We didn't have 100% of the people that voted for the president, but 100% of those people still gonna pay federal taxes. They still gonna have to deal with the president that they got. I don't think we've had any president that's been elected that had 100% of the vote. So what I'm trying to say is, on both sides, just like we were talking about early with the association, when you try to move into a certain area, just because those people, those neighbors in that area have already negotiated something, when you move in there, you gotta pay regardless of what you, you know, what you feel. So you have to pay your fair share. So when you say they're forced, that's not true. And I think it's misleading people, and it's a fabrication for the state of Missouri. I don't know about Michigan, but I've been involved in this labor movement for a long time, and I don't see it. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Representative Weber. Thanks, Chairman. Gentlemen, you're from Michigan? Yes, sir. I didn't catch where you were from. From California. California. Um, have you guys read the fiscal note? Do you know how much this bill costs our taxpayers? Please enlighten me. No. Okay. Um, well, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you test the money bill, it's, it's an important component. It's about $7 million. Um, so, I mean, I, as much as I'm excited about you guys coming from Michigan and, and California uh, to tell our taxpayers that you think we should spend our tax dollars um, on selection, um, I, I, I think that's an important important thing to know, important thing to be aware of. Um, the other thing I was going to ask about Michigan, I actually was up in Michigan a couple weeks ago uh, in December. Uh, got some Marine buddies up there. And there's been a lot of talk about statistics, and we've been talking about growth in different states and all that. And, and I, mean, I think both sides can agree that there are a million things that go into that. It's cold in Michigan in December. Isn't it possible there's just a lot of growth down in Arizona because people want to move from Michigan where it's cold to Arizona where it's warm? <laughs> we do have snowbirds, yes. But I think that uh, what we've seen over, over, over the course of the last 10 years as many employers um, simply can't keep the lights on with what we were facing. And I can tell you from the Michigan experience, you know, that there were many more components involved in helping turn our economy around. Uh, I'm not here to say that, that Michigan's freedom to work status was the be all, save all, end all. There was a plan that was in place that our, that our legislature and governor were willing to, to undertake to be bold, and this was included in that, in that plan. Okay, but you, we can agree, and I think everybody who testifies for and against that that there's a there's a hundred or you know a thousand different components that go into all this stuff, and and I would argue that you know we talk a lot about growth in southern states, which um, tend to be it, you would say more right to work. Um, I think that can be explained just for everybody as much by uh, the prevalence of uh, central air conditioning now compared to 20 years ago and immigration. I mean those two things 
account for a huge amount of growth. And I just think that uh, for both sides, when we talk about um, just blanketly comparing states that have vastly different tax structures, vastly different geographies, vastly different immigration patterns, to, to narrow it down to one thing, it just doesn't seem to really to work. I would agree. It's, it's a multitude of things, but when he asks, when, when site selectors are out there seeking location for companies to locate, one of the top two things that they ask about is, is this a state of freedom to work state? What is, the, what is the labor environment in that state, and how is it going to impact me as a business? And if that investor, somebody that seeks to put their money into invest and create jobs, sees that there is a hostile labor environment, sees that workers aren't, be given, aren't being given a choice, they choose to locate in other states. We've seen it with many different companies. Then the last thing i got to ask you, because a bunch of people have been wanting me to ask you this, um, you know, if, if, if what you say is true, and, and I disagree with you, but, but you know, um, doesn't this give Michigan a competitive advantage? Why are you, why are you coming down to Missouri to, to try to help us level the playing field with you? I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't you enjoy the competitive advantage in Michigan? We're competing with the globe, sir. And, and you know, I think we as a country are also competing with the globe. And if you look at uh, where our country's headed and where we're going, we need to make sure that, that we are being given as workers and taxpayers of this country in all states an opportunity to make the decisions that are best for us and our families. Uh, let me add here, <clears throat> our committee has looked at all kinds of uh, issues that affect the income level of citizens of each state and the freedom level, et cetera. And, uh, we know this for an absolute fact that those states that have no income tax, and there are eight or nine of them, uh, are very attractive to, and our fair state of California has lost a lot of businesses and individuals to those lower tax states. Your state is very competitive in terms of the core of the middle part of this uh, nation and has to compete with those states surrounding you. Kansas now is on a path to lower taxes, and you as legislators have to be very cognizant of the competitive uh, impact that that will have on you, on your workers, et cetera. Certainly, gentlemen. The right to work is simply another issue that is something of competition and, of course, a fundamental concern because it directly affects freedom of individuals to choose their own direction in their life. Gentlemen, you said that we're competing with the globe. Um, the news stories are covered with uh, garment workers um, you know, being being killed in, in locked factories um, in Bangladesh and, and Chinese um, workers working for slave labor if they're not actually slaves. I mean, is, is it your suggestion that for competing with the globe, we should be competing with them? <laughs> That's, that's not our suggestion, that, that, that at least from my perspective, that we ought to be enslaving any worker. In fact, we, again, speaking to the bill, we believe that all workers deserve the right and the freedom to choose what's best for them and their families. Gentlemen, I, um, first of all, that's my last question. I appreciate uh, your testimony. It would be nice to have Missouri people telling us how to spend our tax dollars, but I thank you for coming to our state, and I hope you have a good stay, and um, I hope you enjoy your visit here. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Mr. Bruce Hillis. Phil Malukin. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Phil Malugin. I'm president and owner of Phoenix Home Care. I want to very quickly make a case for right to work by bringing back to um, maybe memory awareness a uh, ballot initiative that was passed in November of 2008. The Missouri Proposition B, also known as the Home Care Initiative, 
was an initiated state statute on, in fact, November 4th, 2008. This was on the ballot in Missouri, where it was approved. The statute amendment to the revised statutes of Missouri relating to home care amended Missouri law to establish the Missouri Quality Home Care Council. The Quality Home Care Council ensures the availability of home care services to the elderly under the Medicaid program by recruiting, training, and stabilizing the home care workforce. The annual cost of the program has been estimated at over $500,000. This, in fact, was not a home care initiative. It was a unionization initiative. No stakeholders, that being clients, caregivers, providers, vendors, or the state advocated for this initiative. So why the rather impressive deception of Missouri voters at the time this ballot um, initiative was put to the voters? The reason why is $2.8 million reason why. 13,000 consumer-directed care attendants will be impacted. They had no knowledge of this. The average hourly pay for a con consumer-directed care attendant is approximately $9 an hour. We employ about 900 individuals, and several of them are consumer-directed care attendants. We pay between $9 and $10 an hour. The average union dues would be two times their hourly pay, so just roughly $18 an hour, or $18 a month would be a typical union due. That would produce $234,000 for the SEIU um, in, in monthly dues and $2.8 million in annual union revenue on the backs of these uh, consumer-directed care attendants. The SEIU, in fact, invested right at $940,000 to get this initiative on the ballot. And it's my contention that there would be absolutely no interest in Missouri if Missouri and these 13,000 attendants had a right to work. We also have this same program. We um, are a provider of this program. We work in this program, have a large program in the state of Kansas. SEIU has shown absolutely no interest in organizing, unionizing, pulling these attendants in. There's just been no interest at all. Currently, this program pays $14.76 an hour. As I already testified, we are paying our attendants, and most all vendors and providers have to do the same because it's called the free market. It's competition. Uh, the attendants are going to work with the vendors that are willing to pay the most, and so consequently, that's how you grow a business. Uh, there's 1476 an hour that is paid, period, by the state of Missouri. So there's just not much of a pie left, but yet the uh, unions are wanting to still take a slice of that. And I don't know who they're going to take it from. And so it is something that, on a very personal basis, a uh, uh, piece of history that is potentially going to affect a large segment of our home care attendant um, population at, at no request of anyone in the industry. That's that's why I'm interested in this issue. And thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Any questions? I'll be clear. Go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Uh, gentlemen, actually, this is really interesting. Um, I actually worked on that campaign. Um, and so I know for a fact this isn't true because I actually stood there um, at rallies talking to workers who came and asked us to do this. I know for a fact, because I was there, that there were stakeholders that were caregivers. Um, and so I just, as somebody that was actually in the room when this was happening, I just wanted to, to assure you that there were indeed caregivers that came and asked um, for us to do this. Uh, and so the, this, this paper that you gave us where it says no stakeholders advocated for this is just 100% factually inaccurate. And, and representative two to three um, representatives of the SEIU went out at a time and recruited anybody that you got to come to a rally. We had over 300 attendants at this time, and not one of them, until it came time after the ballot was passed, did it ever hit the radar of them. So I, I don't doubt that people showed up, but it's called recruitment. It's not called um, an organic uprising, period. 
you would you would agree that they did advocate for it though? I would agree that you recruited advocates. There was, there was no we, ground. We recruited problem. advocates, so we have advocates, and so this this paper that says no stakeholder advocated for this is incorrect. I I stand by. The, the statement and the research at the time. Okay, I just want to assure the committee that I was physically there and I know that's not true. And, and right, thank you. Uh, Representative Frank. To inquire briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, actually, it's probably more of a comment. I, I'll go ahead and echo what uh, the representative uh, from Columbia said. I, I too was actually working for SEIU at the time of this campaign going on. And personally, took phone calls on behalf of home care workers asking the union to get involved because of previous experience that they had had in the industry. So the idea that anybody that spoke up on this had been solicited by SEIU, that any champion they had of home care was indeed a union show coming in here, absolutely 100% patently false. I'm a little bit offended you even said it, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm a member of uh, two home care committees here in Missouri and not one. Uh, or you know, these associations, not one association received a call advocating for this. So that that is our experience. That may be your experience, sir, but that has, that's nowhere near the fact that no healthcare worker solicited union involvement. That is a complete another matter and a patent lie. Okay. Completely. Well, it, it, is, it, is not a, it is not a lie any more than an initiative that talked about home care that was actually unionization. Let's, let's try to keep it honest if we could. And I agree. Please do. Thank you very much. Uh, let's hear now from uh, some of the opposition. Is, uh, is Mr. Mike Lewis still in the room? No. Uh, if, if you would please, sir, fill out a form for us. It seems to be meant for you. It's your turn, Richard. My turn to borrow. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, honorable members of the committee. For the record, my name is Richard Craighead. I'm with the United Steel Workers District 11. That's who I represent over here. I guess I could go into a whole lot of details of what we're, uh, what's right and wrong about this bill. But there are a lot of things here that are not right. I want to refute one thing that the gentleman said a while ago, that we did not have to represent those members is in our unit. The NRA says we have to represent every member in that unit, whether they're paying dues or not. We still have to defend those. We have to spend money to defend them. We got to treat them just like any other dues paying member. I just want to kind of clear that up for, for starters. As for the other thing, I want to talk about uh, the intimidation, uh, the threat, them sort of things. I've been a member of one union or another ever since I was 17 years old. I chose to go to a plant work that was union. Never, I'm 58 years old now. I've never felt like I was threatened to do something. I've never been forced to put money where I did not want to put it. I have never had any of these things happen to me. And I've been a member of probably five different unions at one time or another. And this just did not happen. I know of nobody. I've known a lot of union members all my life. I don't know if it happened. I don't know if this was years ago or what, but I mean, I started in 1971. So that had been earlier than that. I'm not saying things didn't happen sometimes, it got out of hand somewhere, but for the most part, I've never experienced anything like that. My union has never, ever, made me feel threatened on anything. I always have my say in my union meetings and most of the members come to the union meetings and have their say also. We may not agree, you know, on a lot of different things, but we always had our say. And we've never been treated like that. And with that, I will uh, keep it short and sweet this afternoon. But uh, if there are any questions on any of these matters, I'll try to, my best to answer for you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Just to inquire briefly. Yeah. Um, thanks, gentlemen, for being here. Can you? Uh, you may have said this. Now, who are you here on behalf, and, and how many members are in your union? I'm on behalf of the United Steel Workers District 11. We 
of uh, we're in heavy industrial. We're in the manufacturing, heavy manufacturing here, but there we're very diverse. We have a lot, but most of us manufacturing so it's brick. I come out of a brick plant. And, and how many members are member of your union? We, we represent about uh, eight to ten thousand members in the state of Missouri. And have you been a part of that union for how long? Since you were seventeen? No, since I was twenty-two. Okay. There were other unions in between. Longer than I've been alive. <laughs> no, don't put it that way. Thanks, <laughs> <Right. laughs> Sorry, but in, 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 all, in, in all seriousness, so it's more in deference to you because I help me understand. We've heard from prior testimony, just, just previous to you, a little bit. Um, was this concept of freedom to choose, and it's kind of a mantra that I, I hear a lot it, that I think is uh, put forth as a central platform for this piece of legislation. Tell me, I, but then I hear you say, you know, you did it voluntary, um, you chose to be a part of this. Um, help me understand that process from from not only, you know, how you made that choice, but how the shop organizes. Well, how your shop, shop organizes is, once you get a contract, there's a whole drive to organize. You that members out of the facility are asking for representation because they've had some problems with the company one way or the other, and they're wanting representation. We go in, see if there's enough people that's interested in it, that can stay with it to organize, then we're behind it. We help these people out. If, once we get a contract, you're not, the closed shop is illegal. You can't do closed shop. Well, let's stop with that. What? Explain to me what a closed shop is. Closed shop is, is where you have to belong to the union to get a job. And so that would be illegal in the state? Yes. In federal. Illegal all the Federally, yeah. Yeah, you can't do it. So at that point, when you go in, the first contract you get, you're going to be what they call open shop. Most companies do not give that up on the first contract. It's usually a contract or two down the line. And what it boils down to is the companies, the employers, usually work with you pretty well on it because they don't really want this either. Uh, I've been coming over here for seven years. Every year I go to my employer and I ask him if he's got issues out here that he's got concerns with. I also ask him, I said, are you for, you guys going to be for right to work? You going to be for numerous things. No, they're not. They don't want it in place because it creates division and turmoil within the work. So somebody's always going to try to get something for nothing. We know how these people are. A lot of people want to pay for these or pay for what we get. Others, as you know, if they get the opportunity, they will not pay. And that creates people on this side are mad, people on this side. And that just tears up your work. So that's a big issue inside your plan. You need a stable workforce in order to do really well and hopefully save your plan that you're going to be here for a while. So you've heard from employers that feel like right to work would actually tie their hands in negotiating these contracts. Yes, sir. And so, I mean, to me, that's the opposite of what we're hearing. And I think that's a big misconception, I think, about right to work, that in a way it actually restricts the right enter into these contracts between <coughs> private parties. Well, it does happen. Uh, in order to get those, usually it could be brought up maybe in a contract. After. Some of them get them on first. Try, try. We definitely want them. I don't know why I think about that. We want them like it. But generally, after at least the first contract, the employer, because it, he's already doing it for several of them, he don't want all this mix and match and everybody arguing, griping about the plant instead of doing it job, which is what they're supposed to be doing. And they want it just one way or the other. And we do have to represent those people that don't join. You've got to represent everybody even if they don't join. And if they don't join, you refund, or how, how's that handled? A certain portion of their, under the Beck decision, explain to us again. Well, Beck, all right, uh, with Beck. Part of the dues are refunded that aren't core functions, is that? You can become a dues objector. Uh, okay what that is. At that point, you don't like the way uh, your unions spend it political. You can opt out. You're, you're done, you're out. So you have the freedom to choose. You do have the freedom to choose. You get out of the union, the fair share fee comes to the part only that deals with collective bargaining. 
It has nothing to do with it, what we spend politically. That has to be split out every year to the Department of Labor. And it varies from year to year. So, you know, one percent, you know, they do ten bucks a week. All right, if you opt out non-political year or anything like that, then you may end up paying eight fifty or nine bucks. That's the easiest way to put it. And if you opt out, do you have to pay for the political contributions? Or is that that's completely no, separate? That's separate. Okay. Are you talking about PAC money? I, I don't really even want to talk about it, but I just want to know that it's separate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all separate. That, that, because we cannot take that was also stated earlier, is yeah, that they're forced to contribute to for political, political campaigns. Our local treasurer, we can't do that. Thank you, gentlemen. I don't have anything further. Thanks. Any Hampton? Inquire, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead. Richard, I warned you about being the first one. I <laughs> Go ahead. More of a question or inquiry for me as you've gone about through your years and with the organization uh, of uh, bodies into unions itself. Have you had a group or unions say, this is not working out the way that we saw fit and we would like to discontinue being a part of this union? Uh, yes, I have. And, and I know of them, yeah. Okay, here in, here in the state of Missouri, mm -hmm. Through the steel workers? Uh, some have been, some have been other years. Right. I, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay. And if you wouldn't mind to elaborate, what was the reason or condition they chose to move in another direction? Well, since I wasn't personally involved in them, I don't really know. Some of them just didn't want union, some of them. They decided what it is a decent, what you're talking about. And they get, they're unhappy with the reputation they got or whatever, their reasons. And they just don't like it. They want out then their people, you know, you've got freedom to do whatever you want. Then they then go through a research process. That would take them out of the union. They take the union off the work. And at that point there's no more union there. Quite frankly, a few of the ones that I've had knowledge of and wish they hadn't done it once it was done. But they do have that freedom to go back and try to organize again. It's to be different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much, Richard. Um, Mr. Ramshaw. Thank you. Chairman, committee members, my name is Scott Ramshaw. I'm a member of the Plumbers and Pipefitters Local 562 out of St. Louis. In, in Missouri, we cover 67 counties, and uh, we have contractors that we have uh, talked about this before this committee that we have relationships with that have been in business over 100 years. And uh, those, those contractors have relationships with end users, Boeing, AT&T, Cameron, Ford, GM, and one of the uh, gentlemen that testified talked about global. When you talk about global, you're talking about competing against the world. I know you understand that part of it, but when your line is down, for whatever reason, for a short time, that line has to be up and running, and it takes a qualified, well-trained workforce to hit those due dates because of the month, month. When you're down, money is time, and time is money. These billion dollar corporations with the, with the, with the different uh, relationships they have with the contractors feel comfortable with the building trades in the state of Missouri. Um, just to give you an example with Ameren, we still have the world record for replacing four steam generators on a nuclear power plant. And that's due to all the trades that work at, um, at the Callaway nuclear plant. There's a lot of time that goes into these plants and shutdowns to um, meet these schedules, white collar workers, uh, plant engineers, uh, facility um, individuals that work on the facilities, 
And so when I tell you the building trades, it works for um, what it, what it works for a union, secure, union security clause that has worked for the building trades across the state. Now there are some contractors in this state. Greg, Greg Holbach was one of them. We compete against him all the time on different projects. Some private, some sector, some some private sector, and some federal, and even in Missouri work. When you win, you win. When you lose, you lose. Um, that's just part of the process. Um, one of the things I also wanted to talk about was uh, we, we do feel that, as stated earlier, lower wages, lower health care benefits, we feel that will come as part of uh, right to work. And it's important to us to have our members making good wages, having good health benefits, and having good retirement packages. Because we all know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 52 next week. I'm just starting to see my parents and my mother-in-law and father-in-law get into health care issues. There's a lot of things that happen in this state. I've been here, I've been up here for eight years, and people talk about jobs. And I'm not, I'm not blaming any one side or anything, but economic development hasn't moved through the House and Senate like it should. And I don't know if that's because of uh, personalities or egos, or we haven't had the right dialogue to move economic development through this state. And I think it's important to know we belong, the plumbers and pipefitters belong to the RCGA in St. Louis, and we're proud members. And we work with those individuals on a daily or weekly or monthly basis and attend their meetings. They reach out to us for help on economic development. The Chamber of Commerce in Missouri reaches out to us on economic development. And I, I'm surprised that sometimes these chambers sit, sit down here and hit us, labor as a whole, because when they can't get the deal done or over the line, they come to us for help take that to the bank so with that that'll conclude my uh, testimony if you have any questions I'll be more than happy to answer them. Good afternoon gentlemen good afternoon. Let, me, let me ask you a question about wages you know we heard some, some uh, testimony earlier um, through your collective bargaining agreement between your contractors and your union members, that pay and benefit level, that's the maximum they can ever own, right? Earn, right? No. I mean, we have we have a, a, a baseline of wages and benefits. So, so you're saying that, that they actually could earn more? On the wage side, yes. That's not the testimony that we heard before. We heard that, you know, with a collective bargaining agreement, it keeps um, workers from bargaining for more wages and benefits. No, I mean, there's there's ways for uh, contractors who have long-term relationships with individuals that work for them to pay them more over and above scale. That's that's not a that's not a problem. So I'm sure I'm sure union contractors do that. And I'm sure open shop contractors do that. And Greg Holbrock talked about that earlier with some of his six-figure numbers he talked about. That, that, I just find that interesting because that is who I heard say that. And, um, it's certainly been my experience that I know union members that make more than the scale. So that's the that's just the baseline salary. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Thank and, and just one other thing on that. I mean, you know, I'm an organizer for Local 562, and, and we do advocate to bring uh, union members in. And we uh, look for companies to talk to and you can go from bottom up or top down but there are a lot of individual companies that will come and talk to the unions the owners of the companies that want to join a union because they see the best value and the training that we have in this state is best value that's why Ford GM and all those big companies that's what they see and it's a five-year apprenticeship program Greg Holbach has an apprenticeship program I don't know how many members he represents, but they only bring so much value to the table on certain projects. Each project is, has a different expectations. Each owner has different expectations on what their needs are. It's not about Greg Holbrock. It's not about the plumbers and pipe fitters. At the end of the day, it's about Boeing. It's about AT&T, Ford, GM. That's, they're, they're directors, board of directors. It's about them. We're just part of a process that they feel comfortable with not only on a local level, but on a national level, talking to the internationals, because there's not just projects in Missouri, 
There's projects all over this country. Even in right to work states, they'll, they'll go to the contractors that have uh, union contracts to bring in the skilled workforce to finish projects. So um, I'd be more than happy to meet with anybody if anybody has any questions later on too. But uh, it's, it's not about all of us in this room. It's about doing economic development in Missouri. It's not getting done. We're in support of, of economic development with Speaker Jones. We're not supportive of this. To acquire briefing, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Ramshaw, for coming here and testifying. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your testimony. Uh, we're kind of winding down now, and it seems to me that the committee may be hung up on, on two major points, and that being, uh, I've heard, got to go round of this. Is the union therefore required by law to represent all members within a bargaining unit? Um, I wonder, is there anyone from your side, those opposing this bill, that may provide any kind of expert testimony on that, because we've kind of heard folks who may be not directly involved with it, but maybe as part of their industry. I mean, I don't have anybody here from our group, but uh, just to bring up to speed, well, most most members come to plumbers and pipe fitters because they want to be a plumber or pipe fitter. Uh, they're sprinkler fitters as part of our, our national association across the state. Um, we're proud to be members of Plumbers and Pipers Local 562. You know, I'm, I'm sure there's some members that don't like some things, and we have discussions and we try to work those out. Um, on public employees at St. Louis Airport, uh, down at City Hall, people we have at um, the Dome, or some people we'll have at the ballpark with uh, private contracts with, we have some people that do not want to join our union. And we're okay with that. They don't want to pay union dues. But we represent them. And they're no different, treated no different than anyone else. But it, for sure, they have to follow the same guidelines that each individual has to live up to the expectations that you could do that job. Because so, the buildings that we walk into, when we walk out of, they have to be up and running. There's no, there's no give or take. You're talking about multi-billion dollar corporations with multi-billion dollar pieces of equipment no matter what, no matter what uh, chemical, nuclear, I mean, there's no downtime. I, I, I do appreciate that. I look forward to getting anybody at all that kind of checks out on those questions there. That, that's kind of interesting. And then lastly, maybe just a comment, Mr. Chairman, that I, I do also want to join those who have complimented those in attendance today, as well as the um, entire committee. Um, when we talk about um, going after and actually ending a way of life or I think some of the folks maybe here today consider unionism actually to be a way of life, something that's held sacred, something that's constitutionally protected. And when you have a committee up here actually debating should that way of life be ended, I got to commend every one of you guys in attendance for the disciplined behavior that you've conducted today, as well as the, uh, the committee itself. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Ken Menkes. Jim Fall, I'm an attorney uh, who represents the AFL-CIO. I can answer some of the questions that you just raised about, you, sir. about uh, the union's requirement to represent a bargaining unit, whether or not uh, individuals in the unit are members. Um, there's been some back and forth about whether or not uh, that has to happen, and I think we're getting mixed up in a distinction, uh, albeit understandable, between what a bargaining unit is and what a union member is. The bargaining unit is the classification of employees um, that has voted democratically to become a part of the union or to not have the union represent them. After that point, sometimes before that point, but after that point, the union members are the ones who uh, pay the union dues, the full dues. The union, however, is required to represent the bargaining unit as it's been certified under the Act. Um, the National Labor Relations Act. I bring that up because there was some testimony about some briefs that the AFL-CIO had and other unions had written, and the fact of the matter is whatever was in a brief is not the law, and the law as it, as it exists today 
um, is that the obligation for an employer to bargain with the union as the employees represented is grounded in majority rule. And the NLRB says that that is well settled law and it hasn't changed. There's any Thank questions? You. Yes. Um, I was actually wondering the same thing. I mean, I had my lawyer had, and, and I was hearing about the brief. And I, so the distinction was that brief that they were referencing. What explain to me what that was? Or it comes out of a case from uh, early 2000s. It resulted in uh, 2006. It's a case called Dick's Sporting Goods. Uh, the gentleman that referred to it before never uh, mentioned what it was. It was called Dick's Sporting Goods. And what happened in that situation was a union came in and tried to organize a bargaining unit. There were certain uh, men and women who said, we want to become part of the union, but they were less than the majority of the bargaining unit. The union went to the employer and said, we have this many employees. It's less than all of them, but we have this many, or less than half of them, but we have this many employees that we want to sit down and negotiate a contract with you. The employer says, we don't have to because you don't represent everyone. You're not going to represent everyone and you don't have a majority support. The union went to the National Labor Relations Board and filed a charge saying that the employer was not bargaining in good faith and refused to meet and bargain with them, which would be a violation. The National Labor Relations Board said because you don't have support of the majority of the employees in the unit, they do not have to talk to you and it is not a violation of the law to not contract with you. They said, uh, the outcome of that was an appeal to what's called the Advice Department of the National Labor Relations Board. They call it advice, but really that's the last stop. That's like the Supreme Court at NLRB. Whatever the advice says is uh, the rule. They yeah. can't appeal a decision from advice. And advice said in 2006 uh, that in the absence of representing, having support of the majority of the employees, um, Union member or not is different. That's another distinction. Supporting the union insofar as wanting them to represent you and supporting them financially as a union member is different. Um, but the NLRB said that the statutory language, the legislative uh, language is what they called settled and that according, they dismissed the charge and said that without a majority of the union there and your majority support, and your commitment that you'll represent the entire bargaining unit, member or non, un member or non, there is no duty to bargain with the union and no contract. So, so the rule really hasn't changed in the sense of it's still you need a majority rule. Once you have that, you can be a bargaining unit. Yes. And at that point, the union has a duty, the duty of fair representation, to represent everyone in that bargaining unit equally. They can't take union membership into account when dealing with you in bargaining uh, or in grievances or anything like that. So that's the requirement that creates this issue that I think we're all grappling with is that free loader issue, the free loader issue being Correct. a folk, somebody who wouldn't have to pay their fair share for that duty of fair representation, which the, the union is obligated from that point forward to provide. If, if a member or a member of the bargaining unit, non-member of the union, but a member of the bargaining unit who's covered by the contract, doesn't believe that the union is sticking up for them, doesn't believe that the union is supporting them, they have a road, they have out, uh, roads to file not only grievances, but also charges with the National Labor Relations Board against the union, and uh, what's what we call a 301 lawsuit, suing the employer and the union for the union's act. There are three avenues that they have to do this, um, and, it, and it's done regularly. As a union attorney, occasionally I have to defend cases. So, and let's go through, when you opt out of the union, yes. and you say, I don't want to pay for, you know, anything that's not a core function, correct? Um, how do they know that that's being tabulated correctly, that their money that's being refunded is accurate? Are there audit requirements? Yes, under federal law, every year a union has to do a complete audit of all of its finances. Every year it has to then publish and give to every bargaining unit member or every union member a description of, who the auditor was, what the audit found, and how much of the total union dues went to core functions, core representation, and that's the amount that an objector has to pay. Uh, everyone has to be made aware of that, and on a yearly basis, the union has to audit itself, and audit itself again, and audit itself again. If for some reason there's something that uh, a bargaining unit member or a back objector 
thinks is being charged that shouldn't be charged, or thinks it's too high, or thinks maybe the audit was wrong, they have the right to appeal and have it done again, or challenge uh, the finding and say, well, you say that this you know, certain activity was part of bargaining, your bargaining obligation, but I think that it was outside of bargaining, and you go to court over it. Um, and usually the National Right to Work Federation is nice enough to do that work for free for that objecting member. But in, in practical terms, I mean, what that does is it provides transparency, it provides some safeguards, but what, I mean, the, ram the ramifications for the union not complying would be very expensive, I think. Uh, it, it would, yes, <laughs> it's very expensive, very expensive. So there's, there's an also incentive. fines from the Department of Labor and, um, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, that's right. Uh, fines from the Department of Labor and also oversight from the Department of Labor. Every union is also uh, obligated under the Department of Labor to be randomly audited at any time the Department of Labor decides it wants to audit you. Thank you. Nothing further. Go ahead. I just have one question on that because, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, my labor union. They're required, we have a meeting once a month, and they're required at every meeting to hand out finance reports. Every month you get a uh, you get a copy of the minutes from the last meeting and the finance report. The stewards are required to take those and hand them out to the people that weren't there. Is that a is that just is that a requirement by law, or is it just something that they do? There's a there's a requirement under the law that anybody who is a member, you know, gets it. You, you, labor unions are like other organizations. They're not like associations where you uh, join in pressure groups or lobbying groups. A labor union does not exist outside of its members. It is their democratic organizations that the members decide everything on, up through the constitutions and everything. So every member has a right, not only under the common law, but also under the Department of Labor, that they have the right to all the information that's going on in the union. Now, some unions take certain protocols saying, okay, as a steward, this is your job and you're in trouble if you don't do it. Other uh, unions might say, well, we're going to put everything in a newsletter. Some unions might say, put something in the newsletter saying, we're keeping this at the hall and you're welcome to come up and look at it, but we're not going to put it up. Different unions might handle that different ways, just as different corporations might take, you know, give information required to their stockholders in different ways. But the access to the information is always there because the union is the employees. It is the workers. Representative Frank. I'll, I'll be real quick. First of all, I just want to thank you for, for providing some clarity to that. That's been kind of an issue that's been going around the committee. It seems like all day long, so I can't tell you how much I appreciate your, your expert advice here. So then, if those who, who we, a union must represent the entire bargaining unit, that yes. you, and if we adopted the bill into law, that may provide some folks who did not want to pay to actually be as your earlier freeloaders. Uh, absolutely. Um, as, an as an attorney, I don't like the he said, he said kind of sure. stuff. That, that, that being said, I'm going to do it right now. I was recently on a telephone, converse, a telephone call with a lot of attorneys from across the country, some who worked in right-to-work states, some who did not work, oh, work in right-to-work states. What was interesting is one gentleman was talking that he had a representative union who recently had to go through a decertification uh, election where some members decided they no longer wanted a union to be represented there. Said the company thought that they would be sort of, the union would be kicked out because only 60% of the members of the bargaining unit were actually paying dues. At the election, <coughs> over 80% of the employees said, no, we want the union still here and we want the union to represent us, but still only 60 of us want to actually, 60% actually want to pay it. So there's a very big distinction between um, wanting to be represented by a union and wanting to be a union member. And in uh, states like Missouri, where men and women are able to come together and negotiate together, uh, the Supreme Court has recognized that there is a freeloader problem and has taken steps to ensure that it doesn't infringe on people's rights. So, so the analogy I made earlier was one of, of a private subdivision, which, which I, I live over in Northwest Jeff County. We have an awful lot of these where you have a private subdivision with private roads traveling the route, but when you buy a home, you agree to take on a road dues. Um, if you don't pay, yeah, there's, there's some enforcement there with liens and those kinds of things. Correct. Um, but if we were to pass legislation today that said, no longer shall you be forced to do this. You have an individual right. Even though the majority said, we think it's a great idea, you get to freedom of choose. You get to choose if you want to pay this dues or not. 
And if I say, you know what, I don't have the money, or I see my neighbor next door hasn't paid for two years, therefore I'm going to be paid, what is all going to happen to those roads? They're going to, they're going to disintegrate and disappear because the uh, individual decisions of a majority of the people are being ignored. And I think we've, we've, we've said that before a couple times here, talking about majority rule and, and democracy and those kinds of terms. But it seems to me, we, when I was a kid, it seemed like we did more things collectively. And I'm getting to this kind of, uh, uh, nothing else, attitude, I guess, from some of the people who testified today. It's uh, all for me and, and forget to everybody else. And it's individuals and, and it's what I can get out of this and no interest whatsoever in the, the good of the people, the good of the community, the good of the state, or the good of my fellow man. And I really wonder if, if that's where the society is going right now, if that's where the economy is going now, to our very own detriment. Uh, I, I don't have authority to speak on that. What I, would, what I would say, though, however, is that the entire scheme of national labor relation policy from the 1930s onward is intentionally phrased in the idea of industrial democracy and that men and women's rights um, under the Constitution shouldn't be left when you clock in for work. And so we're gonna continue, we represent ourselves democratically and send men and women to our state houses and our federal legislature, um, that in the workplace, there's gonna be some modicum of democracy as well. And that's the purpose of the act. And we used to you know, pass things and say, you know, okay, we have, we have a, a, a group here, if, if you know, a majority decides to go one way, you know what, I may have not decided to go that way, but for, for the good of my fellow man, for, for the good of the community, I'm gonna go ahead and go along with it. We, we as a body do it every single day. Not pure democracy, mind you, completely representative democracy. Representative democracy. So, so it, it, this is actually in the workplace, we're actually bringing those individuals together, right? And yeah. saying, what is your vote? How do you want things to go? And then expect them through some type of civilized society to say, I will respect the rule of law, the rule of the majority. And, and uh, it's in, in a portion of the uh, the National Labor Relations Act, the decision to join the union is uh, overwhelmingly done by uh, secret, by ballots, just like we vote every day, you know, and decisions to make what do we want to offer uh, for contracts is a group decision, like uh, Representative May had talked about earlier. I thank you for testimony, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, now we're going to hear from Mr. Michael Kilkus, who will be testifying for. Here today. Um, I'm not representing any group. I'm a uh, citizen of St. Louis. I'm a combat veteran. I served with the 57th Seoul Helicopter Company in Kantum, Vietnam in 1968. And I learned something. I learned when I came home that what I did didn't mean anything. First job I tried to get when I got home, they just opened up a GM plant in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I went in and applied for the job. And I had the skills. But the man told me that I couldn't get the job because I wasn't union. The only people that they were bringing in to work at the plant were union members and union members' families. And I had no chance of working there. Now, I'm sorry, but uh, Maybe there's something wrong with the way I think, but I think when a man goes and serves his country and puts his life on the line to protect it and to keep the rest of the people safe and to protect their rights to be able to speak and say what they want and do what they want, he should have a chance to get a job. I wasn't the only one that was turned away. I had another opportunity when I moved to Dallas, Texas. There was a company down there that made canopies for the F-16. And I was a vet. In the military, they teach you, you do your job, you do the best job you can do, you work as hard as you can, you get it done. I worked there two months. It was a, a union and a non-union plant. You could go either way, and I was non-union. My boss came up to me, he said, Mike, I gotta let you go. I said, what did I do wrong? He said, you haven't done anything wrong. He said, you're working too hard. The union has told us that if we don't let you go and get you out of here, they're gonna strike. I don't see any fairness in that. And I've had it, and, and listen, I have nothing, I have no problems with the guys behind me. These guys are family members, they're, they're working people, they work hard, they do their jobs. 
And I had one of them say to me today, he said, well, you know, there's, there's, and I can't remember what his rule was, but he says there's a rule they can't do that. Well, I'm sorry, I was fired. There was no explanation. Just the fact that I worked too hard. Now, the last time I worked with anything to do with the union was I, I was living in uh, West Virginia and I needed a job bad. And I was an electrician and there was a, a company, and I'm sorry I can't remember the name of it, but it, it was in northern uh, um, Virginia. And they made the uh, material that goes inside the exhaust flares on the, on the space shuttles. And I went to work there as, as an electrician. And I had to be a part of the union. And I had to follow the, the union rules and they would slow down work at times because they felt that they needed something from the, the bosses and they, were, you know, they weren't getting it. And there were times when we were asked not to show up and I followed through with everything that I was told to do and they shut the plant down. And it was the federal government that shut the plant down because the safety of the material that was coming out of that plant did not meet the standards necessary to allow it to be used on the space shuttle and the only reason that they kept it open for as long as they did was because the man that owned the plant had the patent on the material as soon as the patent period ran out they shut him down they took the plant over and i was out of work and so was every other union member in there and if they had been doing their jobs and doing what they were supposed to do they would have been fine, but they wanted to shut it down or they wanted to get something that the boss couldn't afford to give them and they got it shut down because of it. We have a problem in this country with jobs and the problem we have with jobs in this country, and I know this because I've been around a long time, I'm 63 years old and yeah, I was probably around before your mom and dad even thought about you. Uh, I have seen a lot of our businesses go overseas because they can't afford to operate in the United States because of the demands of the unions and laws put on them by state and local governments that force them out of the United States. The only way we're going to get our country back, the only way we're going to get ourselves back as one of the largest and strongest manufacturers in the world is to stop putting laws and regulations on them to so start giving them taxes they can work with and to make our country a right to work country if you want to work for a union you work for a union if you don't want to work for a union you don't work for a union and if if, if it was me and i went into a shop and the union guys have worked and they've gotten these kind of special rights and i come in all right if i don't want to be part of the union i don't get those rights i get the job I don't see anything wrong with that. It's not a matter of power, it's a matter of rebuilding our nation. Now, it's just a convenience, or <laughs> I found this thing when I, when I walked past it in here today. Um, to me, if you take the issue of the union out of this, it's a right to work. As an American citizen, I have a right to work. As a combat veteran, I have a right to work. And this thing says, if you have the right to work, don't let anyone take it away. And this, this is a document put out by the United States Department of Justice. If you've got the right to work, don't let anybody take it away. This is a free country. And never said in our Constitution, if you're going to get a job, you have to be a union member. And the only way that we're going to get businesses back here is to make it a comfortable situation for businesses to bring their product back in the United States and start manufacturing it here. And I'm, that's all I have to say. If I can, you know, if you've got any questions. Moving three. Good question. Thank you, Mr. I'll be brief. First of all, I want to thank you for your service. Thank you. I serve my country too. Um, I, 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 you lost me a little, I guess, through your testimony because it began to be that manufacturing jobs have left this nation, and if we're going to compete, we've got to lower our wages. Basically, it was a summary of what. No, that's not what I said. No? What I said was if we're going to compete, 
we have to give the business owners the right to operate their business as they see fit. Well, they if had the right if you have unions and the unions are working with the companies, that's fine if the companies are happy, but I should have a right to go in and work as a non-union employee right. I get that, yeah. without any pressure from the unions. Right. Uh, I, I just disagree uh, profoundly that we can compete on a on a wage to wage level by trying to match match those third world labor wages. I, I, I can't tell you how much of a bad idea I think that is to try and lower wages over there, to try and match them at the lowest common denominator. Um, it's, we can do it tomorrow if you want to. I don't think you'll be happy. I don't think the business owners in the crowd will be happy, but we could do it tomorrow. But I, I see I know there was a debate going on earlier this year where some of the other side of the aisle was saying that the, the Democrats believe that government can create jobs. And then the other side came back and said, you know, no, 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 it, it's business that's created jobs. To tell you the truth, I, I think both those folks were probably wrong. And what I believe creates jobs is customers. And having empowered customers who actually have dollars in their pocket and being able to walk into a business and purchase things. And when we lower wages, that's exactly what's happened, is we lower our standard of living, we weaken our middle class, and trying to bring manufacturing here by chasing the lowest common denominator, I believe is absolutely wrong. And I never said that, and I never intended that. And what I'm speaking about with the unions when it comes to the manufacturing end of our country is the fact that they put so much pressure on a business to have so many special benefits and special benefits and special benefits that they can't afford it. They live under the threat of having a strike at some time because maybe the business owner, maybe he's got a problem and he can't afford to take care of some of that. It's hard on the businesses. It's very hard. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Representative White. Uh, thank you. Uh, to briefly inquire. Go ahead. Uh, sir, you did not suggest, I believe in your testimony, am I correct, that we should be third rule wages and pay our workers third rule wages? Well, it's, that's a way for someone to manipulate what I said to make it sound like what they wanted it to sound like. Okay. But you did not, and you did not. No way. That. Is that correct? Thank you. No way. Thank you, Mr. Representative Hampton. To inquire. <clears throat> Gentlemen, once again, thank you for your service to our country. And I believe in your testimony, if I heard you correctly, you worked at a plant briefly that was made up of union and non-union. Both, yes. Okay. And I believe you, if I understood you correctly, said you worked there two months. Yes. And then the boss came to you and told you he was going to have to let you go. Yes. And the reason that he told you he was going to have to let you go was why? He told me that the union bosses had come to him and told him that I was working too hard. And because of it, he was going to have to either let me go or they were going to strike. I believe if I've heard in testimony that that's supposed to be illegal. Is that accurate? Believe me, I, I believe the same thing. But that's the difference. There's a difference between... Guys that work in the union work hard and they do their job, okay? The people that run the union are the problem. And a lot of times they'll go over the laws, they'll go around the laws. It doesn't matter to them just as long as they can get things done. Now, I know there's a few of you here that think that I don't know a darn thing about what I'm talking about. Well, in 1984, January of 1984 to June of 1986, I worked on the Hill in Washington, D.C. And I worked with many members of our Congress there. And I've seen union members walk into, a, not union members, but union officials walk into an office like they were gods. And they were treated that way. And it's not right. The unions are, if you've got a group of guys in a factory that want to have a union and they want to take care of themselves, I can understand that. But when you've got a situation where it turns into a great big organization that's gathering all this money that they can do whatever they want to with and the person down on the on the ground level can't say anything about it that's when you got a problem when you have a situation where you're working in a shop and there's a vote coming up as to what you should do and what you shouldn't do and it's not a private vote you have to raise your hand so that the union bosses can see who's voting yes and who's voting no and then you get some trouble over it afterwards that's a problem so, so what you're saying, you have no problem for, for the folks that want to be represented. You have no problem with that at all. 
I, I have no problem with anybody who wishes to be represented. The problem is I don't think it should be a situation where you go into a factory and you have to be a union member. It's my right to choose. It's the employer's right to choose. And it can, it, you can have both. You can have union and non-union. You, you can have a union plant if that's what the employees want. Every employee that comes in there wants to be a union member. But if they don't want to be a union member, you can't say, well, fire this guy. He doesn't want to be a union member. Or don't hire him. Or make him do this. Or make him do that. It should be a personal choice. When I go up to an employer and I talk to him, and he says, do you want to come in as a union member or a non-union member? I should be able to say I want to come in as a non-union member and be able to get that job and do that job. Thank you. Representative Weber. I'm going Oh, yeah. Gentlemen, um, this this time when you said that you were let go because you were working too hard, that was down in Texas, you said? It was down, in, as a matter of fact, the, the, the factory was right on the borderline between Dallas and Fort Worth. Okay, and Texas is a right to work state, correct? It is now, it wasn't then. I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, what I'm trying to say is it, it was a right to work state, but at that time, if you had a union if you had a union in the shop, the union controlled what was going on. In a right to work, but it was a right to work state. It was a right to work state. Now it is a right to work state. It was that okay? So it was a right to work state then. It's a right to work state now. It was a right to work state by name only back then. Now it is a right to work state. How how is the state a right to work by name only? When a union boss can come up and tell the, the manager of the corporation or the company that you can be fired for doing your job, and if you don't do it, they're going to strike. This, this bill we're talking about um, today, uh, this was the law in Texas at the time, correct? The, the, the I don't believe it was the exact law, but I don't know. I, I didn't study Texas law. I just know what's going on here. Okay, so my point is this was a right to work state. So even changing this right to work would not have changed your situation in Texas, right? Yeah, it would here. It would. Making the law the same would have changed the situation? Because if I went in and did my job at a local company, my, and my employer appreciated it, he wouldn't throw me out because the union boss said they're going to go on strike because I was working too hard. Okay. Um, and then I guess my, my only last question is, I mean, when you say go on strike, you mean, I assume you meant the entire local, you just get a couple guys. The, the people in the plant that were union would shut down their part of the plant, walk out and go on strike until I was gone. So all these people were going to shut down the plant, they were going to leave their jobs, they were going to give up their paychecks, um, they were going to put their families, multiple people, lots of people were going to put their families through that hardship of going on strike because of you. Hey, I don't or understand a, it anymore than you do. Charismatic leader, I say. No, I don't understand it any more than you do. I don't know why, except for the fact that I was doing my job and I got a lot of work done probably twice as fast as the rest of the people did. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't... As you said, this was a long time ago in another state, but uh, I, I appreciate you coming here today. Well, I, I appreciate you your, your, your comments, too, but you have to understand that sometimes things aren't just as simple as everybody lays it out. I, I have no reason to lie. I don't come in here with any political kind of gain on my, on my part. This is what happened to me. I, I appreciate you coming in. Thank you for sharing your story. Thank you, sir. I'd like to hear from Ken now, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Ken Menges. I'm a registered lobbyist, and I am the state legislative director for the United Transportation Union and the new Smart Union, the Metal Air Rail and Transportation Union. Uh, I'm here today, we've heard a lot of statistics on either side, but there's one stat, and I've Googled this thing over and over and over again, and it still comes up. Every three to four days, Missouri goes to work and doesn't come home. She dies. She dies, doesn't come home. The right to work state, 36%. Please of turn your mic on. It is, I'm sorry, it looked, in a right to work state, it is 36% higher. That is the lowest number I could find. I found some studies that showed as high as 52%. In Missouri, we have over 100 people a year, which I find totally unacceptable, die on the job. We 
we want to increase that by 33 deaths every year in Missouri. Any questions? Uh, next witness will be Jim Cabell. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, those of you that, that sit on the committee. I'm pleased to be here. My name is Jim Cabell. I'm from Springfield, Missouri, from uh, Representative Burleson's hometown. And uh, I will tell you that I'm the principal officer of Teamsters Local 245 in Springfield. We have about 2,400 members there. I'm also the president of the Missouri, Kansas, Nebraska Conference of Teamsters that has about 40,000 members in the state of Missouri. Uh, that includes Teamsters. It also includes some brothers uh, from our rail organizations, from the BLET and from the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way. About two weeks ago, uh, in fact, I think two weeks ago this past Sunday, uh, Representative Burleson was quoted in the Springfield News Leader as saying this, and I quote, employees in states with right to work laws are better off. Respectfully, I have to say that I disagree with, with the representative uh, about that. That same article, uh, the reporter that, that wrote the article then went on to say that every state that borders the state of Missouri has lower annual mean wages than Missouri. I can tell you that number overall in this country, in, in the 24 right to work states, the 26 non right to work states, overall in this country the difference in wages is a little bit over $5,000 a year between workers that are in non right to work states versus right to work states. I will tell you that that $5,500, $5,500 a year is money that those workers spend on clothes for their kids, house payments, cars, appliances, groceries, gasoline. If you make Missouri a right to work state, and if Missouri becomes the average right to work state in the United States, and you remove $5,300 worth of income from every family, every worker in the state of Missouri, you are killing business in the state of Missouri. Those are dry cleaners, those are grocery stores, those are car dealers, those are gas uh, people that sell gasoline at gas stations and so on. There's disparity in health care that's much worse than the wages. In right to work states, 20% less workers have health care than in non-right-to-work states. That health care is taking care of the sick kid, taking care of the worker that's ill, taking care of the spouse that's there. There's an even greater disparity in pensions and retirement benefits from states that are right-to-work states versus those that are non-right-to-work states, that you'll see more people being able to retire with dignity, with pensions, with 401k monies, whatever it happens to be, in the states where they are not right to work. The tax base for roads and bridges, we're dealing, you all are dealing uh, with road issues here in the state of Missouri. Wages go down, the tax base <coughs> goes down, the streets and roads crumble with what goes on. The poverty rate in those right to work states is greater than it is in Missouri. Now those are all numbers, and we've all heard lots about them today, but numbers really don't lie, but I will also tell you that beyond economic costs, that there are social costs. And I won't tell you that there I have a direct relationship about what I'm going to say to you now, but there are social costs. If, if you look at the states that are right to work states versus the states that are not right to work states, if you look at domestic abuse and see which one has higher rates, you will find overall there's a much higher trend in states that are right to work states. Domestic abuse, child abuse, and I could go on. Education levels are lower in those right to work states than it is in non right to work states. We ought to be about improving people's lives and making Missouri a right to work state simply doesn't do that. 
I've heard talk today about Oklahoma. I will tell you that uh, because of my job, I work in Oklahoma with some frequency. I was in Oklahoma about three and a half days last week. Since Oklahoma passed right to work in 2001, I will tell you that the information that I get out of the state of Oklahoma is that manufacturing jobs have shrank dramatically in the state of Oklahoma. The number of new companies that were coming in post-2001 versus pre-2001, the percentage of new companies coming in is less now than what it was prior to that time. Just in Oklahoma City alone, when I was there uh, at a local union last week and talking with workers there, uh, General Motors has moved out of Oklahoma City, a pretty new plant that General Motors moved out of. Dayton Tire has moved out of Oklahoma City. Western Electric, Lucent Technologies has moved out of Oklahoma City. Delta Faucets has moved out. Mercury Marine moved out, went to Wisconsin, to a unionized plant in Wisconsin. Wrangler Jeans, Zebco, and there's a long list of others that are smaller than that. These are major big manufacturers that have moved out of the state of Oklahoma since they became right to work. Right to work is not the panacea, it's not the thing that brings jobs, it's not the thing that keeps jobs in, in, in their state or it will not be in our state either way. Uh, I just urge you that as you think about this and study this matter and talk to workers, and I did hear somebody say today, where are the workers at? That why aren't they here testifying? And uh, with the exception of the one brother that was just here just a few moments ago, and I'm not sure whether he's a Missouri resident or a Texas resident or a Michigan resident, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, but, but other than him, I've not heard a single worker that's doing that. Missouri doesn't need right to work. I urge you to reject right to work in the state of Missouri. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, now here, Denise. and I'm the Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Associated General Contractors in St. Louis. The AGC of St. Louis represents 400 corporate members who are commercial, industrial, heavy, and highway contractors, industry partners, and related firms in the 23 counties along the eastern side of the state. House Bill 77 would make Missouri a right to work state, and the AGC is comprised of both open, shop, and union uh, contractors. Under current law, those companies individually elect to become open shop or union into, or enter into a collective bargaining agreement uh, with organized labor. This is a basic free market decision that's made by the contracting firm when they begin to start business. The construction industry in our state includes many firms that are respected nationally, regionally, and locally for their quality of work and their outstanding performance. We believe that making Missouri a right-to-work state damages substantial investments in employee training programs, health care programs, and retirement programs, and we oppose these changes. Through bargaining agreements, private industry is currently funding, private industry is currently funding education and training of a current and future construction workforce, health care benefits, financial security for retired workers, and safety training. If Missouri were to become a right-to-work state, the construction industry would be significantly damaged. Under the Federal Employee Retirement Insu Security Act, ERISA, as amended in the 1980s and 1990s, the responsibility for underfunded and unfunded pension plans falls to the employer, the contractor. In the construction industry, this means that the individual firms will bear the financial burden of returning to the funds to solvency in spite of the fact that they have fulfilled their contractual obligations and paid into those funds on a timely basis. The reality of this law for existing union contractors in Missouri were the state to become a right to work is one of complete devastation. Faced with, with having to buy out their portion of the underfunded pension plans for every employee that they've ever hired over the years would force even large, long-standing contractor member firms of our association to go out of business. This would result in a loss of significant industry knowledge and experience within those firms, as well as an increased unemployment of workers, and then the resultant reduction of taxes paid to the state from both the corporations and their employees. We recognize that proponents of right to work tout that the passage of this law might 
increase economic development in Missouri. What we are told from our contractor members is that based on the ERISA law requirements under federal law, it would definitely cause a loss of employment in the construction industry, plus a loss to the state due to the corporate and income tax, individual tax revenues that would be depleted or wiped out when large construction firms cease to exist. I'm leaving behind a copy of our position paper on this, which explains in much more depth and detail about the ERISA law. It is a quite complicated law. And um, we just respectfully oppose right to work and uh, appreciate your service on this committee. Thank you. I will now hear from Raymond Heffner. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Raymond Heffer. I'm a registered lobbyist in the state of Missouri. I am also the executive vice president of the Plumbing Industry Council. I'm speaking today on behalf of the Plumbing Industry Council, which represents 150 union and plum plumbing and mechanical contractors in the state of Missouri who hire the men and women of Plumbing and Tech Local 562. I'm also speaking on behalf of the Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors National Association who hire the men and women of Sheet Metal Workers Local 36, and administer the contracts for 190 contractors. Uh, Ms. Hasty actually kind of stole my entire speech. She did such a good job. Um, but I would like to say, uh, I heard a way of life mentioned uh, for these contractors. I represent 150 union plumbing mechanical contractors. The Sheet Metal Air Conditioning Contractors National Association St. Louis chapter administers 109. We have multiple members who have made this a way of life for over a hundred years. These are small mom and pop shops all the way up to some of the largest mechanical contractors in the country. They have elected to be union contractors and those contractors are vehemently opposed to the passage of this legislation. I'd also like to point out one piece of information uh, that comes from the adverse economic impact from the repeal of the prevailing wage law in Missouri done by the Department of Economics and the University of Missouri, Kansas City. And I will quote this verbatim. In the 25th Annual Corporate Survey by Area Development Magazine, businesses planning relocations were surveyed as to the factors that would most influence their decision to relocate. Right to work was ranked 20th in the most recent survey. The top factors influencing firms' relocation decisions include labor costs, state and local tax incentives, highway and airport accessibility, energy availability and cost, and proximity to major markets and state tax exemptions. I would, like to, uh, I would like to point that out because I know that was a topic of discussion. That concludes my comments. Appreciate your time to testify in front of your committee. Thank you very much. I'll bring this to Mr. Brian Kelly. Hello. Uh, well, one of the first things I want to do before I uh, deliver my spiel that I've prepared here for you, uh, good representatives, is to uh, thank you for holding this hearing. And uh, I've been fortunate to be down here at this Capitol seven years in a row now, and I uh, appreciate your attentiveness. Uh, there's been times even when I spoke on uh, cell phones and uh, uh, texting bills that uh, there were people texting and talk and looking at their cell phones while I was testifying. So. I, I think you guys have paid a lot of attention and gals and, and I really do appreciate that. I, I mean that sincerely. One thing I also want to say is that I'm a 37 year union member. I've been in three different unions. The first one for a couple years, the second one for 15 years, and the last one for 20 years. I'm with the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainment. I'm their state legislative board chairman. I'm not a god, as somebody talked about earlier. So please don't try to bow down or anything. I am the highest ranked. Uh, legislative officer in the state of Missouri, and I'm honored to do that. In my eighth year at that, uh, I served 12 years as a as a local officer. I've got 37 years experience, like I said, in the union, uh, 20 years as a union officer, and as I tell my members, I'm your ser I serve you. I'm your servant. I'm not a union boss, and that term, for any of you that think about using that, is very, very disrespectful. I can tell you who my bosses are. They're the people that elect me, and they're the people that support me, 
And when they get tired of me or don't want me in here, I'll be gone because that's the way we roll. And we consider ourselves brothers and sisters, and we try to be very respectful. And I've got to compliment uh, Brother Hugh McVeigh, who stood up and asked us to be very respectful here. And you'll notice that everybody listening was quiet when he did it. I don't know if your representatives were in the room at that time. But we, are tr we try to be respectful, and we try to do the right things for our people. I'm a locomotive engineer, as I said. I work on trains on the weekends. I try and get cleaned up, look decent, talk decent, act decent, and be respectful down here three days a week. And then I can go back and do my job, put on my blue jeans, ball cap, and relax, because I can tell you, it's a heck of a lot more comfortable buying that seat and that throttle that it is up here. <laughs> Uh, one other point that I want to make before I uh, quickly read this for you is that uh, on page two of your bill, you'll notice that I'm exempt as a railroad worker. I, don't, I, I could say I don't have a dog in this hunt, but I'm also a Teamster. I'm proud of that. We're part of the Teamsters Rail Division. And like I told you, we're brothers and sisters. So I feel like I need to stand up here and walk up here and sit down and say a few words. I appreciate the time. Last point, and then I'll get to my uh, uh, spiel here as I refer to it. In all those three unions I've been in, in those 37 years, and in discussions with my fellow counterpart, Kenny Menges, who came here, we could not come up with a single person who was a dues objector between the two of us. We've been on the railroad 80 years between the two of us. We could come with a single person we could remember, and he's been a union officer longer than I have. So uh, I think maybe this is a solution looking for a problem, with all due respect. Representative. <laughs> all right, I'll read my spiel and then I'll get out of here unless you have some questions. Mr. Chairman, committee members, fellow union members, many of you may not have noticed that last title, so I'll repeat it. <coughs> fellow union members, the fact that you are Missouri State Representative is means that you are also members of the greatest union ever formed, the United States of America. Congratulations. You are also union members of the greatest state in the union, Missouri. By the way, I'm a Missourian. I, I, maybe I should have pointed that out earlier. You have to be, to be eligible to hold your current offices. As we all know, membership has its privileges, but it also has its requirements as well. As union members of the USA and Missouri, you are required to pay your union dues. They are called taxes. You pay them on everything from the income you earn to the gas you put in your car or truck. You pay them for the benefit of all the membership, the greater whole. Like me, you are also elected by your union peers to represent them. In fact, the dues, aka taxes, pay your salaries and expenses so you can effectively represent them. The same is true of me. As you walk through a beautiful Capitol building here in Jefferson City, there is one motto that is almost everywhere you look. It's behind you right now. It is on the floor in the rotunda, on our Missouri flags, staircase railings, even the doorknobs of your offices. The motto to which I refer is on the great seal of the state of Missouri. United we stand, divided we fall. We learned it as children and have reaped its benefits for all of our lives. This legislation isn't about protecting workers' right, rights to work. Workers already have that right and have for decades now. This legislation is about dividing and fracturing unity. Those promoting this bill are not people who are forced to join unions unfairly, but instead people who want to disrupt the universe unity of organized labor and the power that unity brings to workers as a group. Tally how many people have come to tell their stories of being hurt by unions as workers when these proceedings are done. If there are any, their numbers pale in comparison to the thousands of union workers who are proud to be union and glad to have union representation. As I said, I've been coming down here for seven years, and I've seen one time they got a person to come up here, other than the veteran that came up here a few minutes ago, and I respect his service and thank you for his service as I do all the rest of you but I'm not sure he ever was a union member. I, 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 maybe you guys caught that, I didn't. Can you imagine that what would happen to our state if Missouri was to pass right to not pay taxes legislation? How many people would decide to opt out of paying their fair share and how many would decide to pay no taxes at all? 
Almost everyone feels like they pay too much in taxes, so I would estimate those numbers would be in the hundreds of thousands. Our state would suffer immediate chaos and be bankrupt in a matter of weeks if not paying your taxes were a legal option. The loss of revenue to Missouri would be devastating. That is exactly, that is exactly what this legislation is designed to do to us as unions, and that is why it should not be passed. We need to support and promote good paying, safe jobs in our state and not take steps to hurt those who have helped to make them that way. That includes both employers and employees. And I want to restate that. This is about employers and employees working together. They need to have the latitude to work together and make agreements that work best for their purchase, for, for their particular industry, and not be restricted by law from doing so. Once again, big government telling us how to do business rather than letting the two parties decide for themselves. I therefore respectfully request that you, my fellow union brother, brothers and sisters, vote against this bill. I want to add one little fact to it at the end of this. In May of this year, I will travel to Michigan. It seems to be popular for some reason. I don't know, a real tourist trap up there, I guess. But uh, we will celebrate, as Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers and Trainmen, our 150th anniversary as a union, the oldest rail union in North America. We didn't make it 150 years by treating our people bad. We made 150 years by treating them like brothers and sisters. Thank you very much. Um, Byron, AFT St. Louis. Chair and the uh, representatives who serve on this committee, thank you. Appreciate your service. Um, my name is Byron Clemens. I'm the Coke co-chair for AFT St. Louis. I come from a union family. My grandfather joined the union. On my father's side, I believe in 1909, he was first a railroad engineer and then became an operating engineer, which was very confusing for me as a kid. Did he operate a train or a crane? I got it eventually. The other side of the family, my grandfather uh, was a union coal miner and then became a teamster. My father was a machinist. Both my uncles uh, worked on the barge lines and were both union members. For me, my union family and my bigger union family behind here helped make me part of the middle class. I see this law is just one part of an effort to decimate the middle class. I heard someone earlier quote, uh, I think it was John F. Kennedy they quoted, one of the people with the bags of carpet. I have a quote. In our glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans as right to work. It provides no rights and no works. Purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining. We demand this fraud be stopped. I can't say it any better than Martin Luther King Jr. We heard from some folks from out of state telling us how to improve things in Missouri. But we have heard, and it is a fact, that that law allows for fair share for people who choose not to be a member of the union. To set the record straight, a right to work does not guarantee any rights. In fact, by weakening unions and collective bargaining, it destroys the best job security protection that exists in Missouri, a union contract. Meanwhile, it allows workers to pay nothing and receive all the benefits of union membership. That means they don't pay their fair share, they don't pay their dues, and yet they would get raises if raises are collectively bargained, benefits, pensions, those are all issues that people would not be able to get if they're not represented and paying their fair share. Or they would get them, everyone else would have to pay for it. Uh, this bill, I, I worked with a guy from Common Cause a little bit a few months ago. Uh, he showed me a list of bills from the American Legislative Exchange Council and 
this is one of those bills. And it, I'm disappointed that we see these templates from across the country that pop up again and again about labor in Missouri. It's disappointing. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your service. Are there any questions? Mr. Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, you quoted Dr. Martin Luther King, known civil rights leader. Uh, he was killed in Memphis during a sanitation workers' strike. He was there for a sanitation workers' strike. And I think that's a little known fact, but I think it's important to point out. It's, um, it's good to be on the side of Dr. Martin Luther King whenever you get a chance to do so. Um, you said that this was an assault on the middle class, and I agree with you. Um, there's been so much in this hearing. Um, there's, there's legal aspects we're trying to figure out. Um, there's you know, how the national and federal, the federal law interacts with the state law, what's going on in other states. And we've got a lot of different things, and that's why this has been a long hearing, and it's appropriate that it is long. But I think this is the heart of the issue, and I don't want to lose sight of what the heart of the issue is. When you say it's an assault on the middle class, not in terms of numbers of what's going to do or, and all that stuff, but in terms of the process. How is that? How, how does it go after the middle class? Well, in this state, in my eyes, my opinion, um, the middle class gives you the effort to afford to go to grocery stores, some of these things that were listed earlier, and pay my taxes. If we have a race to the bottom, I heard people talking about competing in the global economy. They're talking about competing with Bangladesh, and the Chinese communists and slave labor, that, that's not the direction to go to go in. Are we in a race to the bottom? Are, can we all work together and pass some bills in, the, in Jefferson City that benefits real job growth and invite all the stakeholders to the table, including my union brothers and sisters, to actually get some things done instead of what I see now is breaking down into partisan bickering and the folks who are caught in between are the middle class. We're, we're in a cusp right now. We can go one direction or the other, and I hope we don't go to the race to the bottom. And I, th I think it's important to point out, I mean, we've had the testimony in favor of the bill has sort of been split in terms of folks that say that they think this is pro-union and this would increase union responsibility, and those that say flat out um, they want to get rid of unions, and this is a me me method of doing that. Um, can you sort of elaborate on the role of unions? Because I'm on the side that this, that this would, would well, really devastate unions. I really do. I think that the, the Brian Kelly just absolutely hit the nail on the head with his testimony about um, if we voluntarily pay taxes, who would pay, and what could we expect services? I, mean, I think the same thing would happen. I think it's an attempt to have unions where they're on the mic. Can you explain sort of how they? I do want to answer you. I just right. have to say one thing before I forget about it. Uh, I said I was a co-chair. Co I want to be absolutely clear, when our members sign up to join the union, there are two sections to it. One is to take union dues voluntarily. Uh, they take their union dues out. Separately is COPE dues, and that's for political education. And we cannot mingle those funds. They are clearly segregated. Uh, there was someone who misspoke earlier and said that uh, some people were tired of seeing their union dues being spent on political campaigns. That can't happen. We segregate those funds. Um, for me, I have a, a decent living, a decent pension. I have benefits. I'm able to uh, help send my kids to college. I was able to go to college myself because of the work that my father and my grandfathers did. Um, I think a middle class lifestyle is based on, and the ability to move further up is based on having a strong middle class. And for me, collective bargaining is how, what's help make that happen. I think that's right, collective bargaining. And the idea is sort of like one string by itself, you can really, you can cut pretty easy, but you put a bunch of strings together and you have a rope and it's harder to do that. I would say even a, a net, a spider web, that it's all connected. And that's one of the things, when you single out one group of people, like it, it feels like this bill is aimed at, and, and I see it as an attack on the middle class, that cutting that part of the safety net for everybody is going to uh, jeopardize everything for the state of Missouri, including the tax base. It's, right. it's not a good move. What it does, it weakens the position of the middle class vis-a-vis -vis larger corporations. Because they, they, they cannot, it's much more difficult for me as an individual to negotiate with a billion dollar company than it is 40,000 of us together. 
Um, and we've just been talking so much about other states and what's going on and, and um, the legal ramifications that I wanted to take just a second to really bring it back to, because that is, that is the heart of this issue is, can the middle class stand together or does the middle class hang separate? And, and what collective bargaining has brought to this nation and this state, including child labor laws, right. worker safety laws, benefits, weekends, Labor Day, holiday, those are all benefits that everybody gets that are from collective bargaining, including public education has its roots in, in uh, collective bargaining. The first public schools were started by union members on the East Coast. Thanks, Jim. I know it's a long hearing, but I think that the, the talking about the way it impacts the middle class economically is just an important point. I thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. And I also brought my union card and my AAA card. It's an association. And, and if this same law were to apply to my AAA card, uh, and I didn't pay my dues, I don't think they would come and help if my car was broken down this side of the road. I just can't see that. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as time has expired, um, we're going to have to conclude this hearing. Uh,